Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today's Ascendus Masterminds for Managers webinar. I'm Lauren Young of Freshly Baked Communications, and today I'll be moderating a webinar that is part of a series of interactive experiences with one of our trusted industry experts on the topic of managerial decision making. This expert was carefully selected to provide innovative insights to help improve organization productivity and make sure that we can achieve success within our decision making. Our topic is Uncork the Bottleneck, How to Improve Managerial Decision Making, and Bill Welter, President of Adaptive Strategies, will lead our discussion this morning. Welcome, Bill. Good morning, or so good afternoon, depending upon whether you're on the East or West Coast. For sure. Well, it's a balmy 87 today in Chicago. How is everything there with you, Bill? Um, it's grand. <laughs> better, better than snow. We'll leave it at that. Oh, absolutely. So if you've joined our Masterminds for Managers webinars before, you are aware that these are brought to you by the Chicago-based firm Ascendus Learning Connection, which was founded by learning management expert Sue Drake. Our goal is to provide you with timely presentations that can be expanded into customized learning modules for your organization. In turn, we hope that you can use this information to build supplemental partnerships for your organization and to generate new growth and progress. So the Masterminds for Managers webinars allow us to do three things. First, we want you to meet one of our subject matter experts. These individuals can potentially help you solve a business challenge or something facing your organization right now. Two, we'd like you to experience firsthand a possible solution for your organization. So you do have the opportunity to test the waters before recommending the option internally. And finally, you can see the expert in action to ensure that he or she is a good fit for your organization in terms of their style, personality, and their approach. So just a few housekeeping rules before we begin. Um, we have everyone's phones on mute to eliminate any background noise during the conference. So you can't talk directly to Bill or I, but you can ask questions with our expert during the webinar by using the chat feature. It is at the lower left-hand corner of your screen. It looks like a little um, bubble. Just click that bubble and you can expand the chat to join in on the conversation. If you would like to submit additional questions to Bill or I during the presentation, you're welcome to use that. Um, and then we will have a Q&A session at the end where Bill can answer as many questions as he possibly can during our allotted time. So here's what's playing in today's webinar. We will start off with our challenge of the day, followed by our famous test the water segment. This is a really important part. It allows you to test drive a sample consulting engagement with Bill. And then finally, we will wrap up today's presentation with the what's the buzz segment. And we'd love to get your feedback and answer as many questions as you may have. All right. And this is everybody's favorite game. This is our term of the day. And during each webinar this year, we unveil a new term, something that usually has um, a relationship with the content that the expert is sharing. So the first person who can submit the correct answer in our chat field will win two entries in our end of the year drawing and you will receive a complimentary training facilitated by an Ascendus expert. So we will fill in the gaps a little bit throughout the presentation, so get a good look, and hopefully you'll be the first one to guess it. Good luck to you. And then finally, you can submit questions to us via Twitter. So I am also watching our Twitter account while moderating the webinar. Our handle is Drake Ascendus, and today's hashtag is AscendusMM. So for those of you that are listening only and you're not able to view the live webinar today, this is a great way for you to stay included in the conversation. All right. So I'll just give you a little detail on your host this morning. I serve as the CEO and founder of Freshly Baked Communications, which is a brand marketing strategy and a content writing firm. I am also a four-time award-winning author, and I travel worldwide to speak about how to successfully market a small business on an even smaller budget. So then I'll turn it over to Bill. Um, Bill, I love hearing stories about the companies that you've worked with, your military background. You're just so diverse. So I would love to know, and I'm sure our listeners would like to know today, what is the best decision you've ever made as a business leader? <laughs> 
Okay, so so my best decision as a business leader um, is when I was with Ernst & Young, actually the second time, and I went into the managing partner for Chicago, and I just simply said, Mac, fire me. Um, I'm unhappy. I'm not doing well. Um, and I realized I wasn't doing the firm the kind of good I should be doing them. Uh, that actually launched my solo career. Uh, and fortunately, Mac was a good enough friend where he said, yeah, Willie, really, you're fired uh, in six months, so let's work you out of a job. That's my best decision. Wow. That's great. Okay, so let's go on the flip side. What's the worst decision you've ever made as a business leader? The worst decision I've ever made was uh, in the, also in the consulting arena. Uh, we were running a project that was very much state-of-the-art for a fully automated warehouse and distribution system. Uh, and I should have gone to the outside to bring in a, a project manager, and uh, I didn't. I used an internal project manager, uh, and as I assigned him to the project. I was a vice president at, at the time. Um, project did not go as well as it should. Um, a year and a half into the project, I fired him, um, and then three years, it took me three years to realize it was my fault. Uh, I had put this guy in and over his head, and I, it was easy to blame him, but the fact of the matter is it was my fault. And there's so many things in business, uh, the decisions we make are people-related. Sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad, um, but there are very few decisions that are without people involved in them. Wow. And it takes a really strong leader to be able to admit that, too. So kudos to you. And I'm sure you've had many, many successes since then. Bill begins, I'd like to let you know that he has a special giveaway for you at the end of the presentation. So be sure to pay close attention to the information he is about to share. Take it away, Bill, with our challenge of the day. Okay. So a challenge, a challenge of the day. Uh, I've got about 30 minutes to help you become a better decision maker. And obviously, 30 minutes isn't enough, but what we're going to try to do in the course of 30 minutes is to give you four tools, tips, techniques, or whatever you want to phrase them as, to help you become a better decision maker. Um, my pitch has been for the longest time, wouldn't it be cool if everybody in an organization got just a little bit better? What's the impact would it have? What kind of an impact would it have on your, on your organization? So as, as we get started on this thing, Lauren, would you take them to the Let's Chat picture. Um, and so would you do me a favor and kind of throw in some issues there that says, you know, how would better decision making impact your organization? I'll be quiet for a second while you toss in some words. And Bill, I think this is a great question to start the webinar off with. Um, I could assume that better decision making would impact your business in a positive way, you're able to reach more of your goals and possibly even boost your revenue. What do you think? Oh, absolutely, right on the mark. Um, when something like that happens, um, whether it's the CEO or whether it's one of the middle managers, um, I think the issue there is really uh, you're trying to figure out what's best for the business. And so that's how we're taking that. For sure. So we're getting a few individuals typing in avoiding and reducing rework. That's a big one too. Um, yeah, if, if this this takes us all the way back to the '80s when we realized that if you improved quality, um, you could actually it was free, so to speak, because you didn't have rework, you didn't have scrap in a manufacturing sense. But rework is is true of any business, and so better decisions mean fewer fewer retries, but fewer reruns or, what, or rework, however you want to put it. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's take a look at the survey. Everybody that joined the webinar had to fill out a survey in advance. So let's go to that next. So as you, as you take a look at the survey, the question there is, you know, how many decisions go awry? Uh, go awry? And um, we gave you some nice high ranges, anywhere from 65% to 80%. Um, and the, the vast majority of you said it's 65%. But as we go to the next slide, what you see is it's actually 75%, which is a pity. You know, three quarters of decisions have got problems associated with them. That's why the whole pitch here is what if you just got a little bit better? It's not a question of going from good to great. It's got to going from okay to good is the issue that's there. 
So um, the next question that's uh, it's the the other thing that we asked there on the survey was asking in terms of so in what part of your business would better decision better decision making have the most impact? And as you can see on this particular slide, um, the great majority of you talked about implementation of strategic initiatives. Um, and then depending upon whether you're in manufacturing or in other areas, certainly I would agree with, with operations and, and supply chain. Um, but all of these things are, are pretty important. But strategic initiatives in this day and age is really the, the issue that's sitting out there for, for most of us. So one more time. Um, uh, Lauren, you want to take them to, as we've had more issues on better decision making, and is there anything new that's come up? Um, Sue also mentions lost time. I'm sure you lose a lot of time if you're not making the right decisions initially. Well, part of that gets you to the point of saying, um, if you don't make the great decisions, what you're going to end up doing then is uh, redo them, and it's, it's a terrible thing. The other point that I would make is um, I wrote a book in 2006 that dealt with um, Louis Pasteur's quote of chance favors the prepared mind. And the backdrop to that book is a simple cycle of sense, make sense, decide, and act. And it's, it's you know, four phases of, of being prepared for the future. Sense what's going on, make sense what's going on, decide on the course of action, and then act on it. In the past 10 years, as I've done workshops around the world, literally, I, I started off thinking most organizations are going to be slow, in making sense of what's going on. And the fact of the matter is, to tie into this last comment, the majority of organizations tell me, no, where we lose time is it takes us forever to make a decision. Uh, and so I think that last comment was right on the mark. Um, not only do they have to be good, but they have to be timely. Wonderful. Let's take a quick break in the webinar to go back to our term of the day. So we filled in a couple of additional letters here for you. Take a look, see if you can guess. We have had some people guess it pretty quickly in the webinar, but don't worry if you can't guess. And remember, the first person who can submit the correct answer will win two entries in our end-of-the-year drawings for a complimentary training facilitated by one of our extended experts. Right. So good luck. And we're going to go on to the test the water segment. So this is the opportunity to test drive what Bill does. So I'll give it back to you, Bill. Okay, thank you very much, Lauren. So when we take a look at this, this whole issue of decision-making, I think part of the, the issue that's sitting out there um, is, oh, and Lauren, my screen just came back to life. Would you give me control, uh, see if it will work? Oh, yeah. So yeah, I'll go ahead. The, the thing we're going to try and cover on is what are the four types of decisions we deal with? Just kind of give you a quick download, a, a introduction to a decision process, and then as I said earlier, give you a few tools to use back on the job. So while I'm waiting for my screen to come to life, would you go to the next one? And here's my issue. Not all decisions are alike. The, one of the ways to think about this thing is there are times when we're going to make absolutely intuitive decisions. We're going to make decisions that are, you know, who do I hire? Who do I fire? Who do I promote? Uh, it's not going to be done on the numbers. It's going to be done on how our intellect and our gut work together to tell us who's the right person to do something like this. Second type of decision that's sitting out there is when we really get involved with something that's quite technical. Um, and this, you know, think in terms of the last time you went to get a loan at a bank um, and you put in some answers to some questions and I know I went recently for a home equity loan and within 90 minutes, or 90, excuse me, 90 seconds, they came back and they said, yes, you're qualified. So there's an algorithm running in the background, perfectly technical in that regard. In our world that we're talking about today, we're going to talk more about the whole issue of managerial decision making. This is the whole issue of, you know, how do I run a project? How do I uh, set up a budget? And it's going to be how do I, how do I, how do I? So focus on you as the individual. The bottom line there on the bureaucratic decision-making, and unfortunately, sometimes we think bureaucratic is a bad thing. The reality of bureaucratic decision-making is simply saying we need a lot of people. Um, we need bureaus to run governments. We need departments to run a company. And so if you think of an example on that one, 
uh, you could come up with something that is basically like an acquisition, and that's where that's where a bureaucratic decision would be taking us. So four kinds of decisions. Um, the one that we're going to focus on the most um, is going to be the one that's dealing with uh, managerial decision making. And now, Lauren, let us see if this slide will advance for me. All right. And right. I'm back in control. I love it. <laughs> um, so real quick question for you. If you would just put in as far as what I have just said, and if you're actually listening to me, is a promotion a good example of a technical decision, yes or no? Right. And Lauren, after we get a bunch of answers, if you would just throw up the, the answers on the screen, and then we can move from there. I sure will. So everybody take a look at your screen. You have the ability to vote live, so choose true or false. A promotion is a good example of a, of a technical decision. So I'll give you about three more seconds to vote. Two, one. All right, let's look at the answers. All right, Bill, what do you see on your end? What I see on that, the great majority of the people are right on the mark. They're actually listening to me, and they said it's false. A promotion, by and large, um, is going to be an intuitive decision. Uh, we might try to back it up with numbers, but our gut is going to tell us where we're going to go on this. So, good, you're listening. Second piece that we want to do here is quick chat. As we're going to focus on the issue of managerial decisions, I gave you a couple of examples. Um, give me a couple of examples back what you think would be a managerial decision in your world, please. All right. And Bill, just to clarify, you don't necessarily have to be a manager to make a managerial decision. Is that correct? Oh, my gosh, no. No. Uh, it's really a decision, ind an individual decision for the business, uh, and it could be for, for yourself, for a team. So individual contributors would be in there as well. Wonderful. Okay. So while we're waiting for everybody to jump in on the chat, let's go to the next survey. All right. So the next survey says, what kinds of decisions do you make most often in your work? So you have four choices here, intuitive, technical, managerial, and bureaucratic. So feel free to vote here as we wait for answers to come in for our last question. Give you about five seconds more here. Three, two, one. Okay, let's look at the results. All righty. Um, all the way between, so about 40% are managerial, 40% are intuitive, um, and not surprisingly, there's not much as far, in the far as the world of bureaucratic is concerned. So there we go. Okay. For those of you who have been intuitive in your decision-making, let's kind of roll you into the world of what's going on with managerial decision-making. So let me, let me go straight to the next one on this one and see how we're going. All right. I'd like you to consider a, a simple four-phase process. Um, and it's, it's intuitively obvious but I will tell you from a, a bunch of years, by the way, as part of my introduction, I should have said how many years I, I've spent doing different things. So really quickly, five years in the Marine Corps, five years doing honest to God engineering, 20-some years doing consulting, 15 years or so doing education. Um, I'm an OOG. I'm an official old guy. So I've been around business for quite some time. Um, and what I realize is that we don't follow processes that much but here's four things for you to consider as you're making a decision. Note the issue, explore the options. Key piece on this one is options. Um, go ahead and decide and then track and, and learn from your decisions. And I'm going to give you a tool or something to think about in each one of these particular areas. Underlying all of these four pieces is your need to build and use influence. And I'll tell you right now, one of the problems that I've seen in businesses around the world is I get excuse me, a bunch of middle managers who sometimes want to say, you know what, I can't make that decision. I'm not allowed to make that decision. 
Well, I'm sorry, you may not make the decision, but it is absolutely your responsibility to influence good decision-making in your organization. So the key there is don't let yourself off the hook. Let's go on to the first one. So the first one of knowing the issue is really saying, do, do we really know what we're trying to achieve and the impact of what we're trying to achieve on the business? And I will tell you, oftentimes we chase fads, oftentimes we chase symptoms, um, oftentimes we don't dig deep enough into what's the real issue that's there. So let me give you a hypothetical. Here's the hypothetical situation. Um, we are sitting there and all of a sudden, we, whether it's a retail or operation or a restaurant or whatever the case might be, we've got a bunch of stores and we're getting a drop in same store sales. And you want to know why because you're going to have to make some decision as to how to fix this problem that you've got. So when you talk to the people around your organization, you're going to get answers like this. You're going to get marketing people who say, you know, the problem is we don't advertise enough. And you're going to get operations people going to say for a restaurant, the problem is the kitchen is old and slow. And the menu management people, the problem is we are not trendy enough. As you look at these three problem descriptions, what you should notice is, is that, and this is so true in most organizations, people see the problem through the lens of what they do. And oftentimes, as I put here, you know, the marketing people say, well, the problem is obviously we don't have a big enough budget and we should be advertising more. Um, be careful. Don't define the problem as the absence of your solution. Too often in decision-making, we start with a solution and we should back off. So here's the tool that I'd like you to think about. But before we do that, so of these three, marketing operations and menu management, who do you think is right? And as before, vote. Put your two cents in. And then, Lauren, when you get a bunch of them, let's go to the results. All right, sounds good. They're coming in. I think people are trying to decide. It's not a trick question. <laughs> Go ahead and vote. I'll give you three more seconds. Three, two, one. All right, let's go to the results. All right, Bill, what do you see? Well, um, actually, I would say I would reverse those percentages. Um, I don't think any one of them, all of them, well, I don't think all of the above are right because it can't be those three separate things. The point there is that, and I think everybody got it, it's not from marketing, it's not from operations, it's not from menu management. Um, we don't know what the problem is. We absolutely don't know. So here's the tool, and I've been using this tool for, for quite some time, um, and it's, it's amazing to me. I've got something that is really intellectually obvious and hard to do. So when I run workshops for organizations, um, oftentimes I'll, I'll give them an example and they'll say, oh yeah, yeah, I get it. And then I'll say, let's take one of your problems and draw a cause map. And, and the beauty behind cause mapping is that all we need to know are two words. We need to know the word why and we know, need to know the word because. And we're going to keep using these words on and on and on until we get through a situation. So let me give you my simple example here. So we've got a drop in same store sales, and we ask why. And well, you think about this thing from a business perspective, business perspective, remember. Well, it's either we've got lower guest count, fewer people are coming into the restaurant, or we've got a lower average ticket. When they come in, they're buying less. And maybe it could be both, all right? So I got a why and I got a because. Now let's take the first one, that's the lower guest count, and do the same thing again. Why? Well, now we've got a larger series of becauses. Why do we have fewer people coming in? Well, because it's a population shift. Maybe this is Detroit. People have left the city and there's just fewer people to come into the restaurant. Or maybe... This is a neighborhood that's going through gentrification or this is a neighborhood that's changing its ethnic group uh, and it's what was appeal appealing to one group is no longer appealing to another group. 
or, and, there's fewer people that want to eat in, and, or, there's fewer drive through people. So you could, again, do why, because, why, because. Let's go for the second one. Why do you think there's less, excuse me, why do you, third one, I'm sorry, um, I changed the, the screen on this one. Why are there fewer eat-in customers? We take it again. Well, there's fewer eat-in customers because there's a dirty facility. Well, why is the facility dirty? Well, because it's understaffed. Why is the facility understaffed? Oh, because the owner is in financial trouble. And if I took it one more step out, and this is a true example, why is the owner in financial trouble? Because she's going through a divorce. So it started off as somebody from marketing saying, gee, maybe we ought to change the menu, turned out to be, gee, maybe we ought to get marital counseling for the owner. So when you think in terms of this, cause mapping is a tool I'm just going to tell you, use it. Now, in this 30 minutes that we've got together, we don't have enough time to, to go into all the details behind it. So on this slide, you'll see I say, if you want to learn it, go to thinkreliability.com. This little company down in Houston, Texas is brilliant. And if you want to see some really cool cause maps, they did a cause map on the sinking of the Titanic. They did a cause map on the financial meltdown. They did a cause map on the woman that got burned um, with, by spilling coffee in her lap at a McDonald's 20 years ago. Great examples, and they do tutorials online for free. So you can't beat the price, and you certainly, I highly recommend them. So thinkreliability.com is a place to go. So while that settles in, let me turn the page and let's think about the next step on this four phases that we've got there. The set, next piece there is to think in terms of the whole issue of options, plural. And my comment there on the second bullet is, says, how might we, is something that should be added to your vocabulary. Here's the, here's the point that's here. Way too often, we come across um, with an idea and we say, let's do it, and we turn a problem and the decision into a yes or no. It becomes binomial. Should we or shouldn't we? I really suggest that you spend some time trying to explore four different options. So the four options that I, I work with all the time on corporations, and I just did this last week with a financial services firm, um, you always have the option of doing nothing. Or you have an option of doing something that's safe. It's Let's do something we've done before. We could have coupons for sales, or we could have a, a, a layoff for some of our people if we need to cut, cut costs or things such as that. The ones I want to push people to are doing something that's unusual. And my definition of unusual or wild basically is simply saying it's something we've never done before. Others may have, but we haven't done this. The fourth option that you should at least consider is to take a high-risk, high-upside option. And then the key piece there is to vet them. And in about three more slides, I'm going to give you the tool as to how to do this thing. So when we get to this piece, um, first of all, I'd like to, to get your point of view as to, so I've given you four options, you know, so we'll go back to it, status quo, preferred, unusual, or high risk. Why do you think I would want people to go and have four options? So would you throw some commentary into the chat, please, and let's see what you come up with. So while we're waiting for everybody to put these in, um, which of the four options do you see being most prevalent with the companies you work with, Bill? Well, the, the, the most prevalent is we, we tend to do something that's safe because we're, and I've had a, 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 the chief financial officer of a Fortune 50 company tell me, he says, I will take as many wild ideas as people will give me, but they're afraid to give me wild ideas because of, I, I've got the money to vet, to vet them and to, to try them out, but people think if I come up with something wild and it doesn't work, it's going to hurt my career. So we tend in, in corporations to really stay on the safe side of things. Um, mm -hmm. Where you'll see other businesses are the ones that are growing significantly and are new. So Google does crazy things. Amazon does crazy things. All the, all the current hot topic organizations 
don't do things that are safe. They do things that are wild and risky. Sure. So did you get any comments? We have a few. Um, not all situations are the same, so we need options to choose from. Do you agree with that? Um, yes, yes. Um, let me, so let me just jump you to this. Uh, I've got to pay attention how much time we're taking here. Sure. Um, I want to jump you to where, where I think are, are pieces that are sitting out there. So the four options, why four options? I think there's two reasons for that. One of them is this whole issue of premature closure. Um, we sometimes, as I said before, we come up with an idea. We try to satisfy um, and we go to yes or no immediately. And I think in decision-making, you got to spend at least a little bit of time standing back and looking at the situation and, and exploring the options. My second bullet here says give the nine-year-old kid a chance. A good, when it comes to strategic thinking, back to this whole point about you know, the, the, the survey we did and why good decision-making because it should tie into strategic initiatives and people agree with that, the, the heart of good strategy is doing new things. If all you do is benchmark and all you do is continuous improvement, the best you're going to do is be as good as your competition. If you want to be better than your competition, you've got to try new stuff. As a nine-year-old, and if somebody gave you a cardboard box, that stinking cardboard box could be anything you wanted it to be. It could be a spaceship. It could be a jail for your little brother. It could be a cave. It could be anything you wanted it to be. And then you went to school for 16, 18, 20 years, and instead of being evaluated on your imagination, you got evaluated on coming up with right answers. Well, I'm sorry. In some issues with, with strategy, there are no right answers from history. We're going to have to go invent this stuff. So we're back to my point about put this into your lexicon, how might we, is real key on doing things. Once you've got the four, let's see if this will work. Once you've got the four ideas sitting down behind you, here's a simple tool. This is the second tool I'm, I'm giving you. So the first one was do cause mapping. The second one is learn to vet your alternatives. And when I ask people to vet their alternatives, this particular picture, um, I have spent days with organizations with only this on the screen. We could do nothing. What we, can we expect to get? What are the pros and cons? What evidence is there in the, for the pros? What evidence is there for the cons? What assumptions are we making? And what risks are we going to take? And then you do it for the preferred option, the unusual option, and the risky option. If you get somebody in the organization that simply says, well, I think we should do this, or I think this was a bad reason, as soon as they say, I think, that's not evidence. That's an assumption. So pay attention to opinion versus true evidence. Uh, by the way, this particular tool, uh, Ascendus has uh, on their LMS an opportunity to do some subscription sign-ups. And this tool and explanations behind this tool are sitting on the Ascendance um, LMS, and we can, we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of the session. So step one on this thing you know, is the whole issue of know what the issue is, cause mapping. Step two on this thing says, hey, explore your options. Sit there and, and think this thing through. As we get to step three, or phase three, or however you want to put it, we've got to spend some time thinking in terms of the risks we're about to take, um, and what is it about this preferred option that we want to go after, and how do we have to be care how do we have to be careful about it? Let me raise two issues on this one, um, but in the background here, so you've got a process, and part of this challenge here is not also what you should do, but what you should try to avoid. So before we do that, let me ask you a question regarding traps and biases. So if you would, once again, and this particular one, um, pick as, well, pick whatever you think is the correct answer. So our options here, all of us have biases. No one is fully aware of biases. Others see our biases. Or all of the above or none of the above. 
Right. I'm going to go ahead and skip to the results. And let's see. All right, so kind of all over the place this time. Well, I, I particularly like uh, the 50% of you that says um, all of the above. And I probably would tie that in with all of us have biases. But the, also the, the issue that's sitting out there, uh, and I'm going to tell you where this came from, uh, from the research that was done on this. Um, the top three are all correct. All of us have biases. We're not aware of them, but others can see them. And, and that third piece of others can see them makes it very, very valuable. So here's the piece that's sitting on there. When we think about using a checklist to think about this thing, um, awareness doesn't improve decision making, but checklists can improve decision making. I mean, think in terms of an air pilot getting in a plane, and this, this she may have flown, you know, 10,000 hours, but they have a checklist that they use on every time they take off. Um, at least they should. <laughs> I hope they do. Um, the, at the bottom of the screen is a, just a wonderful article from Harvard Business Review um, from Kahneman, Lavolo, and Savoni. And Kahneman is a Nobel Prize winner, and his, his material is really steeped in, in research. So I like his stuff to begin with. It's a wonderful article. What we're going to do is I'm going to touch on a couple of the things that are in each of these, in these different areas, but get the article, read it, and become much more aware of the bias that you're faced with. So one of the things is the we, questions we should ask ourselves. Um, you know, has the team fallen in love with its recommendation? Absolutely true in a lot of organizations. Once I've made a recommendation, I just, hey, it's mine. I love it. I own it. It's, it, it's good. Um, and then did the team allow and consider dissenting opinions? That one is kind of fascinating because think in terms of your organization. If you're running something that's really big and really important, and the vice president tells you how important it is, and you've got somebody out there that's a na that, that d disagrees. We tend to call them naysayers, and we exclude them from the conversation. And that's dangerous. So dissenting opinion is good. Um, we've, we have, uh, I wrote a book with Leo Hoff a few years back, and one of, the, one of our chapters we've got, in this book, it's called Rethink, Reinvent, Reposition. It's a book about renewing a business. We wrote about the whole issue of consensus is evil. Because if all we do is come, try to come to consensus on our decisions, we will come to a very watered down decision where everybody says, oh yeah, I can live with that. If you want to make some great decisions, allow people to vet their opinions as to what's good and what's bad about that particular decision. In the article, there are more things about Ask Yourself. You can read the article and take it there. On the bias checklist for the people who are at making recommendations, we've already talked about alternatives. Remember, there's four of them. Do nothing, do something safe, do something unusual, or do something risky. And then back to the point of vetting your sources, um, you know, think in terms of, of the sources that we used that got us into Iraq. I don't care where you're on the political spectrum. But the point was, we assumed, assumed that there were weapons of mass destruction, um, and we should have done a better job of vetting the sources that were telling us that there were. Okay, excuse me, I had to get some water there. My throat is running dry. The third area to think about is the proposal that's sitting out there. And we talk about kind of the extremes. Of, is something too optimistic? If somebody can, has come to us with a recommendation, and they can't tell us what's wrong with it. I got a problem with that one because nothing is ever perfect. Um, and then sometimes recommending teams are just afraid to go out on a limb, and you need to push them just a little bit to help them get out there. So that's a piece to think about. Third area where we're going to play with is that the, the issue there is you are rarely the sole decision maker. Um, and so this whole issue there, as I put there, you know, you have stakeholders that have to be influenced for the betterment of the decision. It's your responsibility to influence. You may not have the opportunity to make the decision, but if you know or feel that something should be done, don't let yourself off the hook. 
Um, I'm sorry, uh, that would put me in, to put you into the category of of managerial cowardice, and I don't like to talk about that kind of issues in corporations. We got enough of that in our political world. I'll leave that one alone. All right, when we think in terms of influencing, um, here is just common channels that are sitting out there. Uh, you know, we can influence because we're the boss. We can influence because we can rationally explain things. We can influence because people want to go with us because we've got great visions. Uh, we influence people who we have relationships with. It's very hard to influence people we don't have relationships with unless we're the boss or can do the other three above you. Uh, sometimes we influence people because they need stuff and frankly, to be all totally honest with you, sometimes we can influence people because we've got clout. Uh, I was born and raised in the city of Chicago. I understand clout. I don't like it, but it works. The question that's sitting out there um, for all of you, and I'd like you to just kind of help me do some research on this one, when you look at your organization and you think in terms of yourself, what works best for you? So if you just take a second there, and we're coming close to the end on my stuff here, so we're right on time. Um, what works inside of your organization? All right, so the answers are coming in pretty quickly here. Give you three more seconds. Two, one. All right, let's go to the results. Oh, wow. That's cool. That's really cool. Um, uh, <laughs> I love this idea of relationships. And, and um, think in terms of um, building your network. And, and one of the ch I'll go off onto a tangent for 12 seconds. One of the problems that I have with um, so much being done via, tele deep, via technology, I'll just leave it at that, is we don't get the chance to build real relationships. And I don't know where you are in your, your career, but my standard routine for people early in their career is build your network. Um, I, can, I can tell you now, I still go back to people I worked with at Ernst & Ernst, all right? For those of you who are in the CPA world, that's a long time ago. So it was in 1977. I still go back to people and ask them questions and help it, use them for, for sounding boards. Um, networks are great, uh, and so real relationships, absolutely right on the mark. Um, don't forget there's other ways to do it, and you may want to think about that as well as time goes by. All right. So let me wrap things up here, kind of bring things back a little bit. Uh, let's get to this next screen. All right. Not all decisions are alike. We went at the very beginning of this 20-some minutes I've been with you so far. Um, sometimes it's it purely intuitive. Um, it's quick and it's a gut check. Um, intuitive decisions, by the way, are best made by people who have experience. A lot of us have opinions, but if you're not relatively well experienced in your particular area, whether it's operations or marketing or counting or things like that, be careful of your intuition. It may not be fully formed yet. Um, so we'll just leave it at that. Technical decisions, usually cut and dried, we can build them into an algorithm. And on both managerial and bureaucratic decisions, there's checklists that always can help. And once again, uh, if we went back to the Ascendus LMS offering that's out there, I've got a checklist for pending decisions that, um, that you may want to download and, and grab onto. Okay, so last phase on this one then um, is, and unfortunately most, I shouldn't say most, many organizations do not spend the time to learn from both good and bad decisions. And so when you think in terms of this thing, uh, here's my fourth tool trick or, excuse me, my fourth tool for you. This comes from the military. Um, after uh, major training exercises or major combat exercises, the military unit gets together and they deal with four questions. What did we want? What did we get? Why were they different? What did we learn? The point behind decision making is you're never going to be perfect from the get-go. You're not even going to be perfect later on in your career. 
but that does not let you off the hook from becoming better and better and better over time. So track and learn from your decisions, whether they were good or they were bad. What did we get? Excuse me. What did we want? What did we get? Why were they different? What did we learn? You'll notice the question that's not here of who do we blame. That's the one that kind of rolls out way too quickly in too many organizations and the government and other places. Don't waste your time. Don't try to blame somebody. Just get, get this thing over with and done with and learn from it. So let me take you back to this bottom line of mine. Um, as we think about this thing and you think about decision making, um, find the root causes, learn how to do cause maps. Vet multiple options. To some, you could do nothing, something safe, something unusual, something risky. Um, learn how to use your influence. You have it. You should use it. It's your responsibility. Um, and then from all of your decisions, both good and bad, you, you're going to learn. I will tell you, I've been around business a long time. Um, I learned a lot more from bad decisions than I learned from good ones. So with that, Lauren, I think this gets turned back to you, and I will take it to the next slide. What's the buzz, girl? All right. Great job. Thank you, Bill. So Bill just gave you a lot of information, a lot of critical information that is sure to help your organization. And we'd love to hear a little bit more from you. But what did you come away with in this webinar? Was there an example or a statistic or a statement that Bill showcased that made you pause and think about your own company? So we invite you to share some last-minute thoughts with us in the chat field one last time. And once again, our term of the day has appeared. <laughs> so if you've been listening to Bill, paying attention to the presentation, I'm pretty sure you may be able to guess what the term of the day is. I'm going to leave it up here on the screen for just a second. All right. So while we're waiting for our winner today, Bill, would you like to talk a little bit about what you're going to receive or what everyone will receive as uh, participation? Well, one of these things is I told people that they can get this off of um, Sanders' website, but this business decision checklist, um, I've got a checklist out there that's basically set up as a um, red, yellow, green. Um, 20-some questions, be brutally honest. Uh, green means, yeah, I'm good to go. Yellow means, eh, I'm not too sure. And red says, no, no either we haven't done this or we don't have enough information. It's a good checklist. You're going to like it, and it's going to be helpful. Um, and so that's the piece that's sitting out there. Very cool. There's also one more special offer um, that we're giving away. And can you um, – we'll talk about what this is. But first, I'm going to go to this slide. So you may have heard Bill mention a couple of times during the webinar about an Ascendus LMS. So Ascendus LMS, I have the pleasure of introducing you, if you're new to our webinars, um, what the Ascendus LMS is. So for over 20 years, the Drake Resource Group and Ascendus Learning Connection have been committed to leveraging the most effective technologies and training methods to engage learners from diverse backgrounds as well as experience levels. So this May, this past May, we unveiled our newest resource for online and self-paced corporate learning, which is called Ascendus LMS, which stands for Learning Management System. So our team invites your staff and your executive leadership to gain in-depth access to our global thought leaders and an expansive collection of their top presentations that were previously only available through individual consulting programs. So some of the checklists and worksheets, some of the presentations, guided um, experiences with these experts, including Bill, are all located on the Ascendus LMS. So a few things that we feature are um, you would receive 90-day access to an expert's full listing of content. And we have five areas that we're covering right now, business acumen, leadership, marketing and sales, and strategy. So you'll also receive opportunities to register for groundbreaking, either synchronous, cohort, or self-paced online sessions. So if you'd like to do this on your own, you can, or you can work in groups with other business leaders across the globe, which is kind of cool. 
And finally, you'll have access to these expert instructors for guidance and support while you're taking the online courses. So there is complimentary content if you just like to dip your toe in the water to start. So you can get into that to see if your team can decide on which expert access they would like to move forward with. Um, so if you want to go with Bill, you can try his complimentary content and then upgrade to his premium content, which is fabulous. So if you'd like to join us in this LMS or try some of the content, you can visit the website that's listed here at the bottom of the screen, alc.ascendislms.com. And if you're participating on Twitter, I'll be sure to tweet that out as well um, so that you can just click on the link. All right. All right. So another special offer, one of our lucky participants will receive the choice of either a complimentary hour of consulting with Bill or they can have a 90 days premium subscription to Bill's company, which is Adaptive Strategies on LMS, which is pretty cool. So we'll pick somebody at random. We will announce the winner um, very shortly um, via email, so you'll see who the winner was. All right. So I don't know if anybody guessed our time of the day this time. We, we have been getting people come in um, too quickly, <laughs> so we tried to make it a little bit more difficult. Um, I'm pretty sure we may be able to figure out what the bottom line is. Do you want to give them a hint, Bill, the last two? Well, I would say decision-making sounds like the last two. Yeah, I would say so, too. See if we can get somebody to guess the top two lines <laughs> while we're waiting on that. Yeah, this is a hard one. It's a little bit longer. <laughs> Nicole's saying... This also rhymes with blunt wine. So if you can guess <laughs> the top of this, it rhymes with blunt wine. If we can't guess anybody if we can't get anybody to guess the answer correctly, that's okay. We still have other opportunities this year and I'll show you the webinars that we have coming up. Um, we're going to have another one on September fourteenth with Kelly Clement, who um, is the president of the Entrepreneur, which is a great organization. We have one of our brand new experts, Michelle, is going to be with Raising the Bar. She will be featured on October 19th. And then we'll round out the year with Cassandra O'Neill from Whole Anony. Um, she will have the final webinar um, for November 9th. All right. And we have a winner. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, Danette, that's correct. The term of the day is frontline decision making. So we'll try to go easier on you next time. We just wanted to make it more challenging, and I think we went a little too far. <laughs> blunt line. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. It's a good, good rhyme. Front line, blunt line. That's good. There you go. So congratulations, Danette. You're going to receive our two entries in the end of the year drawing to receive the complimentary training. So good job. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Bill, is there anything else you wanted to share with the group? Um, no, just um, when it comes to the, uh, I say no and then I give you my two cents. Uh, <laughs> decision make, this, you know, when you, whether it's strategy or whatever the case may be or planning, it's all words until somebody makes the decision and says let's move ahead. So um, on my little cycle of sense, make sense, decide, and act, you may be great at sensing. You may be great at making sense. That's good. But no, there's no progress made until decisions are made and you move on. That's my two cents. Oh, I love it. That's a great quote to end on. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much. I don't see any additional questions. Congratulations again, Danette, for guessing our term of the day. Um, Bill and I are going to wrap this edition of Ascendus Masterminds for Managers. So we'd like to say thank you very much on behalf of the entire Ascendus team for your participation. And we hope you learned something new that you can share with your team and that you can use to make better managerial decisions over the coming months. So take care, and we look forward to having you preview our new LMS platform. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now.